Okay, so let's uh, dirty our hands uh, and see from the practical point of view how we can program these uh, websites uh, in Python. At least uh, for the first level, for the first uh, technologies, okay, then we will enrich it. So the goal is uh, creating simple web applications. Uh, first, uh, we will work in the interactive inter interfaces, but later we will add, uh, let's say, what we need uh, for doing server-side component with the uh, REST interaction and so on. And we will, uh, we have chosen for this course uh, one simple framework. Uh, we, we checked some of them, and then we decided for this one that I will present you, uh, because it's very easy to start. Uh, so it doesn't require a lot of code or many other tools, uh, but it says a lot of extensions uh, that can say grow it, uh, which we can grow the framework uh, until we have something much more powerful than what we had at the beginning. Um, so the idea is uh, uh, Python is a gen general purpose programming language, and you can of course implement web servers in Python. Nobody wants to implement a web server. We, we said many times it's a standard component. So actually what we are going to do is to use a library that integrates the web server, all the behavior needed for web service, web server, and gives us the possibility of defining our own application logic. This is what we call a framework. A framework is a toolkit for building applications that includes a lot of libraries, actually there are more libraries than our code, uh, that provides uh, a lot of uh, predefined behaviors that we only need to customize or specify uh, for in the detail. Uh, there are several uh, features, uh, um, different frameworks that have different features, some are simpler, some are more complex, the simplest one is just a class in the standard library, it's called simple HTTP server, but it's very, very basic. Mm -hmm. um, there are other servers that are, I try to list them more or less uh, of complexity, but is, these are just the most famous ones because if you go to this, li this list, you, are, you have probably 10 pages or so of different frameworks and libraries and so on. The most famous one is probably Django. It's a, one of the most complete ones also, uh, powerful, but uh, it's, uh, it's already very structured. So you need to program the way it wants. Hmm? And it imposes uh, a, a structure on the application and it's very good for doing this some kind of application. Uh, we, we chose something which is more flexible or it's a starting small one and we chose Flask. Uh, last year we had uh, used uh, Cherry Pie which is good, it's more or less the same as Flask uh, for doing simple things, uh, but uh, there are not many extensions to grow it uh, as uh, nicely as Flask does. So in this course we are using Flask. Um, for, I say, all the information, you can find the, the tutorials and examples, uh, actually the two main sources are the Flask website itself, and there is a book uh, here in Flask Web Development uh, uh, but I would say that the website already gives all the information that you need. Hmm. This book is nice because there's complete examples, but from the explanation point of view, it's very, very short. So it doesn't give you man, much more detail than the website. So actually the Flask framework is the mix of three different uh, um, components. Flask itself is the application server container. So it's the environment in which you program your application. It has a, a general class that, let's say, has all the features that a generic web application should have, that, and that you can customize by defining different behaviors for each page. The Flask uh, application layer includes a web server, of course, component. And this web server is taken from another library, another framework that is included, we don't see it, it's inside Flask, which is called in this way, don't ask me to pronounce it, because I'm not able, 
um, I don't know if there are some, I, 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 I guess it's German or something, German looking, like I don't know if any of you is able to pronounce this word. I won't risk it. Um, that uh, gives the basic HTTP communication protocol. And then for helping us to create HTML pages, and we'll see how, we, how it helps. Uh, there's also another templating engine. Templating engine means creating web pages by customizing the content of predefined templates. It's a way of separating the HTML code from the, from the logic code. Hmm? We'll, we'll, uh, we'll learn the hard way why they're useful. And in this case, uh, the templating engine is called Jinja2. Uh, I don't know what the symbol may mean, but uh, they used it as the logo of the Jinja. Okay. The basic uh, step is uh, uh, to, to work is to install Flask, of course. In many distributions, Flask or Python distribution, Flask is already installed. If it isn't, uh, you just need to do a pip install Flask in the, with the uh, uh, super user privileges, if you want. In the in the Ladisp, it's already it should be already there. It should be already available. You can do if you do this, you will install Flask for the Python installation at the system level. So it will be a system wide installation. All uh, Python application will be able to see the Flask libraries. <laughs> With many cases, it's okay. Uh, if you want in your system to have different uh, Python environments uh, with different libraries, uh, what you can do is not to install it at the system level, but just install it into a virtual I won't go deep into the virtual environments now. Uh, if you want to understand what they are, this link explains it quite well, but actually it's a way of having separate environments, set of libraries that you can activate or deactivate, and each environment has its own copy, let's say, of Python and of the associated libraries. Hmm? Uh, and this, uh, the main difference is that you can do this uh, even if you don't have the super user privileges. So you said it's a local install inside a virtual environment, so with a user level privileges instead of the system level privileges. But this should uh, work uh, in many cases. And then what is the structure of a Flex application? So a web application created with a Flask framework, we call it Flex, Flask application. Flask, the framework, defines one general class which is called Flask with the capital F. This is a class uh, of a generic web application. What you do is to create one instance of this class here and save it into a variable to use later. So app will be the object containing our application. Uh, usually uh, the parameter of Flask is the name of the application and you can use the macro underscore underscore name underscore underscore, which is actually the name of the module that you're programming. Usually they, they, su they suggest you to do this. Right now you have only the application object what you need to do to start a web server is, called, is to call the run method on the application. So app.run will start the web server and we start running this application. Right now the application is empty because it doesn't have any web page defined. You can define web pages later and give the behavior for every web page you define. But for setting up and running the web server, we, you just need these two steps, no more. Okay? Uh, by default, the web server, the word Zeug, what's, what's the name of the web server part, uh, runs uh, locally and it listens, so it's the, on, a, on the local host address, you know, 127.0.0.1, is the local address, means it's, a, um, it's an alias for the current machine, and it listens on port 5000 by default. So if you want to see the website that you created that you're running with Flask, 
you need to open your browser and connect to this address, localhost dot uh, colon 5000. Uh, by default, uh, the website is only accessible for, from your own computer. So if you have your, fr your friend's computer there, you will not be able to see the website you are developing. Because the web server is only listening, is only open to connections from the local host. Hmm? Uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, there are, uh, say, parameters and options to modify this behavior and to let it listen on a public port on all the addresses on or on uh, or, all, uh, or on other port numbers. So uh, if you want to make it public, you can modify the run statement like this, and it will, li will listen on the default HTTP port 80 on all the web addresses, on all the web interfaces that your computer is showing to the world. We won't do it, probably. But uh, uh, the, another option that can be useful is to set the debug is true so that it modifies the behavior of the application server, mainly when some error happens or some exception happens, it will generate an HTML page with the detail of the error. So why we are developing is very useful. After we end the development and we let the users connect to the application, of course, we want to disable this. Uh, in general, if you want to make your web server public, you just open the IP address, 000, zero, zero means all the web addresses on which are connected, and you must use a, star, a port. If you use port 80, you must be, uh, have the root privileges to, for running the web server. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, use another port which is uh, higher than uh, 124, and so it's not as non, um, a non-privileged port that doesn't require root. Uh, the issue is that if you want to expose to the internet your web server you should also open the port on the firewall otherwise your web server will be listening but the firewall will block the connections anywhere so from the outside they will not be able to send requests to your web server because the firewall will block them before the web server will be able to see them and so you so you need both to open the web server and to open the firewall port yes It means that you cannot open a socket connection, a listening socket connection on a port less than 124 unless the process, the Unix process, running, requesting to open that uh, port uh, has the super user privileges. So you need to do sudo python uh, script.py. So you need to run Python with the super user privileges. Not the path, the password, your, yes, sudo, like, like, uh, like you do for every administrative comment. Hmm? Beware that if you're, when you're opening it, uh, every programming error is one opportunity for hackers and intruders to destroy your work or to steal your data or anything else. Okay, so be very cautious. Okay, we have the uh, web server running with no content. How to load content on this? Every page is implemented by a method. You define one method, one function in Python, def function. And this function has the goal of returning one string corresponding to the HTML of the page. So like I said before, the application logic has only one goal to spit out the HTML page. How to do it? Returns a string. All the web page into a string. And uh, we need to tell also the web server what is the, URL, the public URL path on which this page is published. And we do this with this decorator, it's called, at app.root slash. This means that asking the web server, whenever a request comes for this address, your own page, then call this function. This function will handle this address. 
uh, route the requests coming on this address to this function that will be able to handle them. And handling them means returning a string of the HTML code. So we have the name of this function. The, the flash documentation calls them the, the view functions because they are the functions that generate what the user sees, what the user views. And they must return a string. So to try, let's try to make a couple of pages like this for our example project. Two pages in which in one we have some welcome to the project, a copyright, and then an about us page. And to make it more interesting, the two pages will be linked to each other. So it will be an index page, the root of the website, that links to the about page and vice versa. So if you click on the name below, you will be brought to the other page. And if we click to the project, on the project name, you will be brought again to this. Hmm? So let's build this one step at a time. So what I did, uh, right? Is, is the, the website clear? Right. So I created a new project. Example in Flask, and uh, let me create a folder in which source I put the Python sources so that uh, they are. And uh, I want to create, for now it's a very simple application, everything can stay in one module, in one file, okay? So I can call it, uh, uh, how to call it uh, rooster. Okay. So this is the empty. Can you see it? Not much, right? Uh, what is that? Uh, no. A bit better. So, what we need to do is, this is just an empty Python module. We want to convert it into a Flask application module. So we import from Flask, from the Flask library, import the Flask class that will enable us to create the application object. And then when the application is run, we activate the web server. So right now we have the empty web server, right? Does it work? Let's try. Okay, you see it's running on this address. So the web server is running, and you see that this application is still running. It will run forever, because the web server, once you activate it, it's always listening. You need to stop it by killing it, by pushing the red button. If I open the web browser and try to connect to this address, to this address, no? Of a loss, 5,000. Of course, I will get not found. I requested a page from a server. The server replied. The server is active. It replies, but it will tell me the page is not available. Yes, I know. There are no pages defined yet. Okay, but it's running. And you see in the console that you have the list of the requests. You see get slash http one dot one what I did here. The result is 404 instead of 200 because the, 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 the response was page not found instead of okay. Yes? Localhost and uh, is, uh, is a name corresponding to this address. So they are synonyms. Hmm? 
localhost and the 1001 is the same address. It's the local machine. Then, we want to define one page. So we define the index page, the main page, the home page, and we associate this main page with the slash URL, app dot root slash. And so we run, uh, we return one just for for testing some text. This text will be interpreted by the browser as the HTML page. This is no HTML, but it's just, just text. But. So if we run it again, I save the file. What I can do is to restart it so that it rereads the page. And if I reload this page here, the same address, it will tell me, hello. So my browser is connected to my server, and to the only page that has been defined on this server, and is receiving this. Just in your mind, try to split your mind, okay? Like if you were psychopathic or something like that, you must have a double personality. When you're here, you are the web developer. When you're here, you are the user. The user is running on a machine which is in a different continent from the web developer. Try to forget that everything is on the same computer. Okay? They are connected over the internet. Right now, the internet is just the loopback interface, but nothing changes. Okay? So we don't want to have the hello page. We want to have this uh, extremely nice web page. So to do that, we need to create some HTML to return. Um, it's a pain. Hmm? It's going to be a pain because the HTML code means I can use the multi-line strings in, uh, in Python, for example, so that it will ease me. And into this string, I can say, okay, the, 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 the HTML contains a head, contains a title. The title is uh, wake kill, end of the title, end of the head. Then we have a body, end of body, end of HTML. And inside the body, what do we have? The title, H1, ambient intelligence, end of the title, and then the text is a paragraph, end of paragraph. And then the, the copyright a paragraph with the copyright. End of paragraph. So as I said, in the five minutes HTML, you can learn about these four or five tags that I used. Title of the page, heading, paragraph, that's it. Everything in a string. So you can't expect uh, Eclipse to help you with the syntax or whatever. It's just a string. We need to improve this. We cannot live with this. If I run this and reload the page, I get the same stuff. No. What's wrong with me or with you? Okay. 
So something changed. You see here on the top, we have the name of the page, the title, the heading, which is in bigger and bolder font, and then the text. We also need to have the picture. Do you want the picture? So you can have uh, usually Flask requires uh, pictures and other items to be in a static subfolder. I have a copy of this picture here from another. I copy from this to there. And inside my HTML, uh, I, I insert another paragraph uh, with, the, with a link to the image. Image, source, is, quote, static, slash, rooster, dot, jpeg, end of image. So let's reload this. We don't give up here. Fantastic. Uh, okay, it's easy, it's working. We need really to improve the way we write HTML. We cannot write everything inside, inside the string. This is the first page. The second page, well, we define another view function for handling the, the second page. Now the view function associated with the, the address about dot HTML. Define about. You see that this name is just the name at which that page appears. There's no about.html file anywhere. From the client, it looks like there was a file like this. Actually, the file doesn't exist. We are creating it on the fly no? with our return statement. Let, let's meet, let's me, let me steal this and modify it slightly. So the second page uh, about us. Uh, Let me, show, let me be shorter, you are the best. Okay. And, uh, and now, okay. If I start it again, I can modify the address and ask for the about.html URL page, and we give you this page. So what we need to do now is to add the link, the cross links between the two pages. And we can do that in HTML again. In the home page, in the index page, we need to make a small rooster into a link. So a href equal to about dot html quote slash a so a is the anchor tag in html so it converts a word or a fragment of text into an anchor that links to another page and the other page is uh, identified by the href hyper hypertext reference attribute and uh, we do the same for this one, anchor to hypertext reference, href, uh, slash, in this case, slash a, close the anchor. So if we run it again, we reload it. You see that this math rooster is now a link. If I click the link, I'm brought to the about us, and if I click the white heel, I'm back. 
Okay? Very basic. What don't we like about this? Well, we don't like all the hard coding. We don't like writing HTML inside a string. We don't like writing URLs inside these strings because if you want to change anything, we need to recheck everything by hand. So we want to improve. The general idea is okay, but we need to improve it. Yes, there's a question. Yes, it is. Uh, so the question was uh, whether it's possible to return the content of a file. E the, the answer is yes. The, the only issue is that if I return a file, I have no chance of customizing that file, of making it dynamic, because the file is there. So I want to create a file on the fly. Hmm? This is what we are going to do with templates. Hmm? So, but, but we are doing it in, in, in steps so that we understand the benefits. Hmm? So well, this is the first solution. Let's try to solve one at a time the problems that this has. First, addresses. We don't like embedding URLs like this. Because if you want to change the address in which this lives, this is something explicit, very visible. This is hidden inside the code. So a way of uh, avoiding, and we also always want to avoid to write explicit addresses, is to tell Python to substitute the actual address if we give the logical name. What's important is the about function. We want to link to the page that corresponds to the about function. So we use uh, the URL for URL for function of the Flask uh, framework that if I give the name of the function, the name of a view function, it will return the URL associated with that function. So that if I change the root, then everything is, up, is updated automatically. So we will always use this. And also for images, for static files, is the same. You can have URL for and uh, two parameters, one is static and the other is the file name of the image. So that you can generate dynamically these uh, names. It will become more useful when there are user parameters in the request. So right now it's all still static, but we are trying to create a static page in a flexible way. So actually, instead of this, I need to, I need to throw away this href clause the multi-line strings, string, and add URL for, for what? For about. One more. We URL for, we need to add it here, URL. We need to import also the URL4 function. So actually what, the, what we are doing is we are joining together constant strings, pieces of HTML, with the dynamic strings computed using functions. The same for the image. We get out of the multi-line string, concatenate with URL4, Aesthetic element, I name equal concatenate. If it was ugly, it's more ugly, even uglier now. So let's check if it works. So you see, it's the same. Nothing changes from the HTML point of view. 
but we have changed the way in which this content is generated. So we have no longer, we don't have any longer file names inside the, the HTML code. But it's becoming more and more difficult to read. Right? Um, another way, this is another, another solution that you find on GitHub if you want, uh, of the same uh, exercise. Instead of using multi-line strings, uh, in this case, I use the many strings, uh, one concatenated to the other. So one string every line of, of HTML, and then I concatenate it explicitly. If you do this, just remember to put everything into a couple of parentheses so that Python understands that the line doesn't end here. Otherwise, it will consider the statement finished here and will give an error on the line after that. Okay? So it's a, you, you put together inside a, uh, an expression, parentheses, and so Python will wait until the closing parentheses to consider the statement finished. And so you will read it in a single line. It's a bit more legible, readable than having all these multi-line strings. But it's not a solution yet. Uh, there are some uh, details about dynamic roots, uh, roots but uh, I mean, uh, probably it's better to see them after or as uh, because we are not using them now. The idea is that uh, the root uh, parameter or decorator is much more powerful than what we had. So it can bind uh, in, with a single statement a group of addresses into a single function. So all the, all the addresses that start with user slash something are mapped to the show user profile view function. And whatever is being written here will be passed as parameter to the function. So that it's easy to capture parameters from the user, from the URLs, and a group of, of similar looking URLs are mapped to a single function and the functions so will be the same and will act differently according to the rest of the, of the, of the URL, to the parameters. You just need to have uh, these uh, uh, point uh, parentheses, less than, greater than signs, uh, to mark the parameter position, and then add the one uh, parameter to your function. Yes. Physically or by clicking on a link that contains that username. Usually you will generate dynamically a page that contains these kind of links. Hmm. Uh, you can also do some automatic type conversion here. So uh, take this uh, and convert it to do an integer if you want so that uh, you, will, you will save, uh, save time. But uh, they're just advanced topics. And the same goes if you want to generate URLs to the opposite what you are, are what you are asking. If I want to generate uh, this, uh, you see that uh, the profile function is parametric. Okay, it takes one parameter. When I generate the URL for profile, so it's a, it will be in a different page. I can pass the the parameter here, and so the parameter the, the URL gets generated already with the, the right value. So it's all passing parameters, embedding them in URLs, and then extracting them back in the next page. It's a way of passing information from one page to, from one page to the other. You need to embed it somehow and somewhere into the page, into URLs usually. If you don't have any parametric URLs root, then you can also pass parameters, but they will be passed uh, with a question mark as the get with the, with the HTTP syntax for parameters. So parameters may be modifications of the URL or real parameters being added, all with the URL for uh, function. Um, another detail of the upper root is that you can usually, when you define a root, it will be defined for the get method only. 
we will see that when you when we are doing user interaction, usually the forms are submitted with, by the method post instead of the method get. For specifying that uh, a root should be registered for the post instead of the get, or in addition to the get, you may have the methods uh, optional parameter in the root. But let's save these ideas for later, okay? We don't need them now. Now, what we want to do is, uh, on the lines of what you have been suggesting, let's try to move all this HTML into a separate file. But uh, at the same time, we, we still want to have the flexibility of modifying that. So it will not be a static file, it should be a template that can be modified. This is what the Jinja2 library is for. Because embedding HTML in Python is ugly, error prone, and ugly, and complex, and ugly again. Okay, so nothing to do. Uh, templating means separating the HTML code, the static part of the HTML code, from the, which will be maybe the most of your application, and separating them from the little points that need to be customized and modified in every page. And uh, we call interpolation. So inside the template, which is, which is fixed, we interpolate in specific points some specific values of variables or functions or expressions, what we want. Jinja2 this, does this work, and uh, it works very easily. You just put uh, the templates into a folder that is called templates. And these templates will, have, will be normal HTML files. So we'll, they will have an HTML extension. But inside the HTML file, you can put strange tags. Tags for expressions or parameters or variables, which are double curly breaks, and tags for statements. Because this uh, templating language has also its own control structure, the for, the if, the while, or something like that. Maybe you want to skip or you want to repeat a part of HTML depending on the value of a parameter. And so you need some little flow control inside the template when rendering the page. And you can access some objects from the, from the page. So this HTML file can embed, interpolate some values from the Python world. And in the view function, in the Python code, we just need to call the render template function with the parameter of the name of the template that will be picked up in the from the template folder, and optionally some parameters that you want to pass to the template. And the, the template engine will take the HTML, interpolate the values, and return it. So let's try to do it so that we get rid of this ugliness. We create a folder templates, plural with yes. And inside the templates, you can create HTML files. So right now, you can use Eclipse to understand and to help you writing HTML. So the first one will be index. Mm, okay, HTML file for four is okay. So we we'll generate already a template. You, we know we have what's the name? Where, 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 where is that? Uh, Wake Hill. And in the body, I copy from here. Post or okay, let me format it. Then this is the code. Of course, all this uh, escaping is no longer valid. When we have to embed some variable, some value that is computed from Python functions, we use uh, the expression interpolator. Let's put it into quotes. Sorry. Mm. 
So what does this mean? It's an HTML page file that is being copied verbatim, letter by letter, up to this point. At this point, we have a, an interpolation tag. In this case, it's an expression tag, double curly brace. So it will call this Python function, take its output as a string, and insert that string in place of the tag. So we'll remove the tag and in, in its place put the output of the tag itself. And the same here. href can be Just beware, these quotes, this quote here and this quote there are HTML quotes, are required by the HTML syntax, okay? These are the Python quotes for the strings to be passed, passed to the function. So we are jumping to Python from the HTML. And of course, when you're writing this, uh, it will be much easier, no, for example, in Eclipse, you can have uh, all the auto-completion of the text, uh, syntax coloring, and some, um, every benefit that you have for a real HTML file. It's not a real, real HTML file because it can contain this text. So from the Python so source, we have something much, much cleaner. We just need to, to import a render template function so we add a render template to the imported functions. And the index will just render template, render template of index.html, the name of the template file. So it's much cleaner. Right now, this template doesn't need any parameter, so it just we don't need any additional parameters here in the call. And we can do the same for the other, is the about HTML, about, and uh, we again transfer all this ugliness. It's not slash, but take the URL for index. Just remember, we need to put the name of the function, the name of the Python function, not the name of the page. Hmm? And again, we just modify this into a render template. of about. So we are separating in a way the logic, the structure of the application from the structure of the web pages themselves, from the HTML code of the web pages themselves. Template is much more powerful because templates by themselves are objects that can be inherited. So it's not something that we can cover today, but you can define a template for the whole pages of the website and then just make sub-templates that inherit all the structure and just modify the parts that you want. Hmm? So it's very powerful. You can have a general template and then very small fragments in which you only personalize or include the menu or include the, some uh, parts of the page very, very easily. Hmm? You just need to, to walk into the Jinja documentation. So let's check if it's working as we want. Browser here, reload the page, nothing changed. But of course, we know that all this page has been generated in a totally different way. Hmm? And we click here, and we click there, everything works as intended. But now we have a clean structure on which to work, right? So this will be our way of working inside the Jinja. Uh, I mentioned that inside the templates, we can also have statements. 
you can have the list, but basically the two most important ones are for and if. And you can combine them to get what you want. For is the usual iterator in lists uh, or in general collections. And if, uh, else, if, else, and if. Just remember, we are not Python. So the, the end of a statement is not just implicit in the indentation. Yeah, in, in HTML, indentation doesn't count. So the end of a statement uh, is an explicit end for or end if statement. So we are getting used in Python not to close any statement, but here we need to do it if we want to, to personalize it. Uh, yeah, you, here we have a couple of links uh, that can show you all the control structures for and if are the most uh, useful ones, but there are also others. And uh, expressions that uh, uh, tells you what kind of arithmetics you can do. You can also apply filters, for example, take a string, string convert it to, to uppercase, remove the spaces, or something like that. So there are useful functions that you can be applied. It's not, uh, it's not difficult, but uh, it's something that you can do. You can let the templating engine do instead of you doing it with your code. Okay, the final step is uh, to transform this application into something which is really interactive, because right now the only thing that the user can do is to click on this link until he's very happy. And uh, to make it even happier, we want to give the, the impression of a sort of a login function. It will not be a login, we don't have password, but some interaction. So what do we want to do? We want to add one simple form here in which the user can enter its name. So it will be a, a text area and the button. If I submit a name, it will welcome me with this sort of login page. Say, okay, your name is what you're written here. And you can continue to this page. It will be the same as before. You see, index and index, the same page, but where your name has been put there, and instead of the form here, we have some links, uh, check your alarms, log out, and some function for logging users, okay? Very crude. So first step, first step, the form. It's just simple, plain HTML. We need a couple of uh, tags, from form, this is the page from W3C schools about forms. The main tag is form, which is the container of the elements that comport the form, and then the actual elements are used by, are created with the input tag. To make it short, we take the index, so we are working inside the template now, it's much more convenient. And after the rooster, but before the copyright, we add another paragraph. We close it. Inside the paragraph, I want to insert a form. And then we submit it with the method post. The action of the form is the URL of the page is going to handle the data that the user inserts. We don't have it yet, but it will be the URL of the login page. Action is the page that is called when the, the form will be submitted. And inside the form, we have only one uh, the example. Enter name, text area, and button. Enter name, then a text area. You can do it with an input, field, type, text, where is text? Name, uh, user. Name, value. In a form element, the name is what I call the element, what I call the variable. The value will be what the user types. And then another is a button. Type. The button is type submit. You 
it has no name, but it has a value that corresponds to what is written on the button. Okay. Ah, okay. There's an error in the application. I, I already saw the error, but uh, uh, how can I? How can you tell me? I can set the debug mode. the application server, run it again, and try to redo the request. And it will give, give me, oh, it's also an error, but now we have the stack trace, build error login none, and it relates, if you just have a look at which are the lines here that are in your, here, rooster line 13, render template index, but the error is login. Actually, the problem is that I'm uh, in the template uh, referring to this login page that, that, that doesn't exist yet. So I need to create it. So let me create it. Slash login. Def login. For example, for, for the moment, let's not write anything here. But just check. Okay. You see that we have the form here. If I click to login, I will get nothing because the login page is not defined yet. Okay. But I can enter my name here. Cool. It's login. Well, I get an error because it's not defined yet. So let's work on the login page. What do I need to do? I can, first of all, I, need, I must say that this login should be called by a form. So it should be called by the method, HTTP method, methods. It's not a get, it's a post. It must match with this. Form method is post, and then the receiving page should accept method post. If the form is a method get, the receiving page will uh, have method get. But usually you, you, we use post because the get method will show the parameters into the URL of the page. And it's not nice to see all the parameter list there on your browser bar. Then uh, we can render template of this welcome page. So we render template <coughs> all of uh, login. We create a new template. Let's take the about and duplicate it. Uh, login. And then uh, continue. Right now, how can we insert the username here in the template? Okay, we want to insert the username in this point here. Your name or welcome, okay, whatever. So I can extract the username from the request 
and then pass this value as a parameter to the template. So I can extract the username from the request. So whenever I have a form, there is a request. The request object is a, a Python object that contains all the information from the HTTP request that we saw. So all the fields are listed here. One of these fields is the form field, which is a dictionary that contains uh, all the name, value, pairs from the form elements. So we have the form element that will call the username. So I'm extracting the form element whose name is username from the form that has been submitted in this request. You don't like request because you need to import it. And then this username is a Python variable that I, that I can pass here. by giving it a name. So this username is now a value, it's a string. I can pass it a parameter by giving it a name. I chose a different name just to make the difference. This name will be the name of one parameter passed to the template. The template can use uh, the login, the name of the, of the parameter, that comes from the Python code and insert in this place the value of this parameter. Don't confuse the template parameter with the request parameters. Request parameters are in the form object and come directly from the HTTP protocol. Template parameters are whatever we want. They may be the same, they may not, are just values that we pass from the Python code to the template. In this case, it's write the same. Oh, I don't want to close anything. I just took a, some value from the request parameters into a variable, Python variable, and then I pass this variable to the template. So if it's working, the, the logging always works. The about all works, uh, Fulvio, and then will tell me welcome, and we include my name there. And then continue uh, will bring me back to the index page. Right now, what I still have to do is to modify the, the template for the index page by taking into account whether the user was logged in or not. Okay. The problem here is in this page, how can we remember the name of the user? It's not in the form anymore. The form was consumed by the login page. Right? When I was redirected here with the URL for, I lost everything. Remember, HTTP is stateless. When I'm making this link here, when I clicked here, this page knew my name. When I click on continue, I'm just requesting the home page of the website as a new user. Where can I store my name? so that the application can remember in the next pages, in all next page, in all the next pages that I'm going to visit. There's no way in HTTP to do that. Okay? We cannot store it into a variable here. You might be tempted to say, let's store in the application app.user is username. It will not work. It's a Python statement, it's correct. The issue is that the application is one. 
and you have 1,000 users. So every user will overwrite the same value from the others. You want to be able to store information about the users into the application, but isolating every user from the others. It should be a local store per user. This, as a name, is called session. Session. A session uh, a session is uh, not supported by HTTP. Is something that application servers fight to do, fight against HTTP. It's giving state to a protocol that is stateless. Giving to the HTTP request the capability of remembering what the same user said or wrote just a couple of clicks ago that has been duly, uh, duly forgotten by HTTP. So every application server gives you, in Python, it's, uh, it does a way, in PHP there's another, in Java there's another, but every application server gives you the minimum <laughs> capability of storing information into a session. Sessions are containers, dictionaries in Python, of objects that are local to users. Every user navigating into a web website has its own session. Technically, sessions are implemented by cookies and are implemented in different ways from different application servers. The implementation of, of uh, Flask is very stupid in cookies because it puts all the information into an encrypted cookie. I hate it, but anyway, other web servers are more clever. And there are also ways, more extension of Flask for making it more clever. Basically, what we can do is to store into session into dictionary, into this section dictionary with the name, user, username, a value, again, dictionary, name, key, value, name, value. And then this uh, value can be used and reused many times in your application. The only detail is that uh, Flask needs to encrypt the cookies, otherwise it will be very easy for another user to hijack your session, to impersonate you in their session. If they steal your cookie, they can act as yourself. So they want to encrypt it. And you, want, they, you need to write a secret key into the application. So any, any garbage there, but as long as it's secret. Um, we don't have time to write it together. I want to show it how it looks like. The solution for storing the user information is that as soon as I get information from the form, see request.form user, the, the name is slightly different, but I have a, a variable. This variable, the value of this variable will be stored into the session. And then nothing changes. But this value will be remembered, and so can be used later on. Uh, to make it work, I had to add this secret key that I there. And the, where do I use the session? Here in the index. You see, welcome session user. Welcome and the name. We will interpolate my name here, if it's defined. Otherwise, it will be an empty string, so nothing will be written. And later, if session.user. If the user attribute is defined in the session dictionary, then write this. Otherwise, put the form that the form is visible only if the user variable is not defined in the session. And if it's defined, then we have a different, uh, say, menu for actions. So forms, parameters, templates, and sessions work all together to create user interaction. We'll play on some of these on Monday and then continue, okay? Hope you are not too confused, but uh, when you start doing that, it becomes clearer.